Okay. Well, first off, welcome everybody to the Reason and Science Tertiary Education Debate. Um, it's an important topic, one that's of course close to my heart, as I'm a senior lecturer in politics at, in the University of Auckland, uh, and my name is Stephen Winter, if you want to know. But I'm just chairing this event. I won't be doing too much other than sort of keeping the ring and you know, directing services. The, first off, I'd like to thank all of our uh, party spokespeople for taking time out of what are obviously very busy schedules at this, you know, at the, the current junction. The, um, it's an important topic and one that's going to involve very interesting questions and I expect this is going to be a very informative and interesting evening. We'll begin with some apologies. Um, two parties have withdrawn their representatives due to other commitments. We will not be joined by representatives from uh, New Zealand First or the Internet Party and in addition, um, Colin Craig of the Conservative Party is unfortunately sick with a throat infection and can't be here. We also have personal apologies from Simon O'Connor from the National Party, but um, Colin King has um, graciously stepped in, and Jamie White of the ACT Party, but Stephen, Stephen Berry has stepped in for him. Thank you. Now before we introduce the rest of everybody who's here, I should note for the audience benefit that the, some of the political parties who are represented here have electoral material that's going to be available to you that's out in the lobby, and you can look at that after the debate's finished. Further, I understand that there's an electoral commission, uh, but I didn't see it out there. Are the electoral commission people here? No. no. That's a lie. They don't care about your vote at all. Okay. <laughs> a couple of other things. Would you mind turning off your, or at least turning your phones to silent or vibrate? That way they don't interrupt. If there's going to be an interruption here, I want to be the person who makes it. <laughs> and lastly, you'll note there's a television camera in the middle of the room. So um, the, I understand the, the talk of the debate is going to be screened on YouTube. Oh, we'll go up in the next couple of days. So if you want to you know, revisit some of the points made, you'll have an opportunity to look there. Or if you know of people who aren't able to make it, you could direct them to that site. Okay, now let's introduce our speakers. Uh, first on my left is Colin King. He is the present National Party electorate MP for Kaikoura. He is the deputy chairperson of the Science and Education Select Committee. Uh, first on my right is Marion Street. She's a Labour Party list MP, 15th on the Labour list, and is Labour Party's candidate for Nelson this election. She's also a Labour Party spokesperson for tertiary education. Next to Miriam is Julianne Genter. She's a Green Party list MP, eighth on the Green Party list, and is the Green Party's candidate for Epson this election. And then next to her is John Minto, co-vice president of the MANA movement, fourth on the Internet MANA list, and is the MANA movement's candidate for Mount Roskill this election. And then on to the, my left here, far left, is Stephen Berry, the ACT Party's candidate for Upper Harvey, and is sixth on the ACT Party list. Now I'll walk you through the structure of the debate. For the next fifth well, hour, realistically, we're going to hear from all candidates. They're each going to have 10 minutes to present uh, or to discuss past and current tertiary education policy and what, going forward, their party's proposed tertiary education policies will be. You don't need to use all 10 minutes if you don't have it, because <laughs> you can come, out, come back to stuff in the discussion period. To help the speakers, I'm going to have a, a timing assistant here. All right. So when we get to eight minutes, or when there's two minutes left in that 10 minute block, uh, we're going to give a double wrap. All right. At one minute we'll have a single wrap, and at 30 seconds we'll have a single wrap. When we get to that point in time, I'll come over and grab you and visibly wrest the microphone away from you. Now I will have to be strict in terms of timing, because we do have five people and you know, there's lots of interesting things to say, and, but I know that everybody here is a professional and at this stage in the campaign have been through many of these things, I suspect, right, and we'll know what we're doing. Good. So after that uh, series of five introductory presentations, we'll take a five-minute break, give people a chance to rest and think a little bit, after which we'll have a um, question session. Now, for those of you who've brought burning questions or to whom burning questions occurred during the process of the debate, you could always email the candidates. 
because what we're going to do here is we're going to have them field questions which have been provided in advance through social media and emails to the Reason and Science Society. Um, I've got a variety of questions and I'm afraid that if, you're, if you've put in a question and you've come here hoping that I will put your question to the candidates, or, oh, sorry, to the representatives, then you might be disappointed since they had many more questions than they could, they could possibly uh, address in a short period of time. So I've gone through and um, picked out uh, several ones that I think are going to be of interest. As we go forward there, most of those questions will be addressed to the panel at large, and in which case representatives can, I guess, defer. They don't have to answer the questions. But those who do wish to answer the question uh, will be given three minutes to answer that question. And at the one minute, with the, with the point where they have one minute remaining, we'll get a single wrap. And 30 seconds, we'll get another single wrap. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, candidates, you won't have a right of reply unless I say you do. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. But, um, but most of the questions will be uh, at large, so you'll have an opportunity to get your oar in at each point in time, at, at least for every question, um, with, some, with some possible exceptions. But I don't, I don't think we're going to get to those. Okay. Now, and at the very end of the, of the session, a, um, a member of the Reason and Science Society will come up and make some closing remarks. Now, in terms of the order, we'll go in um, the following fashion, and we'll preserve this order throughout. Uh, unless we need to move otherwise. So we'll have Mr. King, Ms. Street, Ms. Genter, Ms. Mr. Minto, and Mr. Barry in that order. And I would invite you to Just begin. The, the, uh, on the... i got to hit a button. There? The button. Might be. Do you want to stand here next to the buttons? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, look, thank you very much for taking the time to attend this uh, political panel tonight. Uh, it shows your interest in the process and I commend you for that. From my point of view, to be up here in Auckland from down in Blenheim is certainly a pleasure and to see something as ornate and as uh, sophisticated as this uh, lecture or auditorium is quite impressive. So look, I, I make that point because as a, um, as a National Party member for Kaikoura, uh, it's only now, in about the sixth generation, that I've actually got a granddaughter going to Lincoln University. So for about since 1860, our lot either laid railway tracks or were shearers or sheep farmers and so on. So when I look at my role now, as uh, previously, as the Deputy Chair of the um, Science and Education Select Committee, I believe I'm doing my penance, really, because I left school after two years at high school. That having been said, uh, we look at tertiary education. It's a very broad uh, subject of, or, or you know, area of funding within the government. It's uh, $2 billion odd dollars, and it reaches right from uh, youth guarantee right through to uh, international education. And, I, and I, that's a, a very big uh, you know, reach, and it's very important. It's very important at the, at the youth guarantee end because education doesn't always work in the classroom for everybody. In actual fact, I've got two daughters now who are on six-figure incomes who actually left school uh, before they even sat their NCEA Level 1, and they went into a private training establishment, and the freedom there actually turned their lights on as far as education, and they really went forward. So I mention that because it is quite often one of those subjects that when you, well, I feel anyway, and I need to be educated, uh, from the point of view of when you go to a university, you actually can be quite overwhelmed by... Uh, the whole extent uh, and challenge that face a lot of people in education. That having been said, there's been a lot of work done in that area, and I must say it's great to see uh, the progress that has been made. Uh, at the moment, I think there's probably 45% of the people that actually make up the youth guarantee are actually Māori, or, and 18% are Pacifica. And those are two groups of, of uh, New Zealanders that we are looking to see success grow and grow, and all indications at the moment is that they are seizing that opportunity and going onward and, and upward. The tertiary education strategy is a tool that the, the government uses to be able to direct and uh, indicate at a high level what they want out of tertiary education institutes. And last tertiary education strategy focused on getting better performance uh, out of 
out of institutions, be it the Auckland University, be it the, the Polytech down in Nelson Marlborough Institute of Technology, or be it a private training establishment. And you might say, well, why was that necessary? Well, from the point of view, it is necessary because still 70% of the funding that goes into the education of a, of a person in tertiary education that's F funded comes from the taxpayer. So from that point of view, uh, it is very important that we put a uh, centre of achievement around tertiary education that the economy, uh, the society and the environment of this nation uh, is first and foremost. So that's why we, we have the STEM subjects, the science, the technologies, the uh, engineering and the mathematics. So that's what the, the thrust of the, the tertiary education strategy effectively was uh, over the last f five years. Now there's been a new tertiary education strategy implemented, and its focus is to make our education uh, sector far more outward focusing. What do I mean by outward focusing? Uh, we mean that it needs to be engaging with those elements that build a successful society, those elements that actually are important for us to connect globally, uh, those elements that actually make us reach out for those people who uh, sometimes are marginalised uh, and, and need that, that actually that help and assistance to go forward. So we are excited about, as, as the National Party, about the, the future of tertiary education. We are excited about the way that that is now being achieved within international education. Uh, it is actually the fifth largest contributor to the New Zealand economy. And it's something that we've really got to keep on looking after and improving. So uh, when we look at the context of the tertiary sector, it is one where we expect that there will be a number of Einsteins in this auditorium tonight, that in, in doing so and in, in, you know, achieving those outstanding uh, inventions and uh, innovations and uh, creating those uh, entrepreneurs and such like is that we will need at least another thousand technicians each time that we create a smart idea that we actually have a very informed economy, a very informed community within that economy uh, and that we do so in a way that grows our society, gives everybody the opportunity to realise their potential and that we don't ever turn our back on anybody just because our structured way of education may not work for them, that we actually provide a very open and inclusive uh, system where if you don't succeed in your first chance, like myself, you've got an opportunity to succeed in the second one. Uh, if you don't succeed in the second one, you can actually go a third time. And that's one of the great things that we see in our education today is that opportunity at, at any stage and somebody, one of my colleagues and friends here might criticise me for saying we've cut out um, some money, funding for older people. Uh, and, and when I put my hands up, we have adjusted funding uh, into areas that we believe are priorities. And it's, it's very hard at times to make choices and please everybody. But look, pleasure to be here. And uh, I will now hand over to another of our, our panel here. But thank you very much. One, two. Yeah. Kia ora katoa. Uh, nā mai haere mai uh, ki tēnei hui e ki tēnei kaupapa o, o te pō. E ngā kai whakahaere o tēnei hui, tēnā koutou. Uh, e ngā iwi katoa, uh, tēnei te mihi nui ki a koutou. Mihi mai, mihi mai, mihi mai. E ngā... Um, Memo Paramata, Tena Korua, uh, Enga Iwi Katoa, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Kiora Koto Katoa. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I greet uh, the people who have organised this event, my parliamentary colleagues, and I'd like to acknowledge the other candidates who are here from parties um, either no longer or not yet. No, you're on. You're represented in Parliament. Or well, is one no longer represented in Parliament anyway? So it's, uh, it's good to be here. It's, um, this always feels a bit like coming home here. I uh, spent nine years of my life, in fact the job I've held for the longest 
in my life was as an academic here in a little block that is uh, just a, a few metres from here that has long since been dwarfed by, uh, by this uh, edifice and complex. Um, so for, for nine years I, I taught um, in the management and employee relations, employment relations department uh, of the commerce faculty. Fortunately, it was also a member of the arts faculty, which allowed one to keep one's sanity. Uh, it, um, I, I taught a whole range of, um, of subjects, but I also um, was the foundation director of a centre, the Centre for Labour Studies, <clears throat> which is now something of an historical relic, which is a shame, uh, because I still believe that we pour a great deal into training employers and we need to put at least the same amount into training smart worker representatives as well. And that's uh, what the Labour Studies Programme did and it was an opportunity for second chance education for many people who would not have thought that their life path would have taken them through the doors of a university. But I want to talk about a few things in particular about our tertiary education policy, because that's what we're here to debate tonight. Labour has always been the party of education, and there are two things only that drive us in tertiary education, or in education generally but in tertiary education in particular. One is quality and the other is access. Quality and access are the two things that Labour keeps coming back to in the provision of tertiary education, no matter what vehicle is used to deliver that, whether it's an apprenticeship, whether it's a polytechnic, a private training establishment, or a university. So everything comes down to those two things. We want quality education opportunities, quality programs available to all who wish to access them, and no one should be prevented from accessing them because they can't afford to enrol. A widening gap between rich and poor in New Zealand currently is threatening our social stability. It threatens a lot of things, but it threatens our social stability. I'm not here to talk about that particularly tonight, but it is relevant to access. That gap between the rich and poor can be closed in a number of ways by a government that has the political will to do it, including by increasing the minimum wage, which is one of our starting points but it can be closed permanently for many people by making educational opportunities accessible to everyone who wants to take them up. Exclusion from those opportunities marks a path towards injustice, poverty and discontent. We know that tertiary education is the key to a smart, innovative future with higher wages, decent jobs and secure stable communities, and Labour believes that every New Zealander is entitled to access quality public education of the highest standard throughout their lives, throughout their lives, and I'll come back to that in a moment if I have time. So for us, it is always about quality and access. Investment in improved skills and qualifications is an investment in our future. Improved skills mean improved productivity and economic performance. It's also an investment in the overall health of our society and our social development. Labour will commit $1 billion per annum, adjusted for cost of living, to keep up with cost of living increases in the education and health sectors and some other public services. The last six years have seen 
are cut in real terms in tertiary education. Perhaps the squeeze has been felt a bit more tightly around politics than universities, but it is still felt by the universities. There has not been a cost of living adjustment to the appropriation for tertiary education. Not once. And that means going backwards. So we have said that we will budget, and we have in our alternative budget that has been released already, even though the government hasn't released its own figures and its projections for the next three years, Labor has. And we have said that we will put aside that money so that institutions can keep up in real terms and not fall behind year on year. We will support our universities with some capital investment for 21st century facilities to match the 21st century research and teaching that we require. We will engage in a conversation with the universities about that. But most importantly, we will review every part of student support. We will review student loans, allowances, accommodation support, and scholarships. We will review them upwards. We're not just going to look at them and say, that looks nice and we'll put it away. We intend to review them upwards because underpinning that review is the need to make tertiary education opportunities more accessible to more people. We will reinstate postgraduate student allowances and access to support for long courses, such as clinical psychology and architecture. We'll do that so that the 24-year-old solo mum in Wellington who was receiving $350 a week with the student allowance and who got cut back to $173 per week because of the short-sighted cuts to support for students doing long courses, can in fact finish her clinical psychology degree. That woman left university to go and work to put herself through the last year of her clinical psychology uh, degree, which means placements, for which there is no uh, remuneration. And suddenly, the uh, student support that she was uh, entitled to for the previous years of her degree uh, was to be cut off. So far, that young woman has not gone back to university. Now, if that isn't a waste of taxpayers' investment, what is? Providing her with support to finish a long course would result in her paying back to New Zealand society in spades by being a trained clinical psychologist. Give her enough support to complete her degree, and that is a successful investment. I want a tertiary education system. Is that? I can't remember how many taps. I want a tertiary education system which values an historian as much as an engineer and doesn't take a myopic and utilitarian view of our education system based solely on today's labour markets. No government has a bottomless pit of money, but labour will remain committed both to quality and access in our tertiary education system because our future depends on it. Kia ora koutou. Good evening. My name's Julianne Gentor. I'm a member of parliament for the Green Party. And I'm not the tertiary education spokesperson. I'm the spokesperson on transport, commerce, broadcasting, associate economics and finance, and associate climate change. Uh, but it's a real privilege and pleasure to be here tonight. I first joined the Green Party back in 2006 when I was doing my master's degree here at University of Auckland in the um, School of Architecture and Planning. And the reason I joined the Green Party was because at the time the then Labour-led government was refusing to fund electrification of Auckland's rail network. Um, and they were putting $10 billion into motorways. And I, I found the Green Party had, was the only party 
that was advocating for a smart, modern approach to transport in Auckland. And they were campaigning hard on electrification, which we've finally seen implemented here in Auckland right as we speak. Um, after the national government came in, unfortunately, they delayed it by about two years. Um, so it's only now being rolled out, even though eight years ago we were campaigning for it. But I think what's great about that story is just that progress does happen. A lot of times it happens slower than we wish it would, uh, but it's entirely possible to get better outcomes. And small uh, political parties can be incredibly influential in making that change. And uh, students who get involved and volunteer for political parties can um, eventually end up as representatives in the House of Representatives um, in a country that they weren't even born in. So that's amazing, and I hope you're all inspired by um, the change that you could be part of. Uh, so as you can hear from my accent, I wasn't born here in New Zealand, but I chose to make it my home because I love it. And I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm involved in the Green Party now. We're campaigning on three big priorities this election. Uh, the first one is a cleaner environment, which I think speaks for itself. Um, it's one of the things that is fundamental to our identity as New Zealanders, and it's part of what we cherish about our country. It's also fundamental to our survival and our economic survival as well, because our brand in the world is based on our clean green image, and it's part of how we sell our products to the world. So it's part an economic strategy as well as uh, being something that we value just for the sake of it. Our second big priority is a fair society. Um, at the moment, the gap between the rich and the poor is getting larger, not only in New Zealand, this is happening in a number of other countries, and it's just a fact about our economic system that wealth will tend to become concentrated in the hands of a few um, unless, unless governments do something about it and ensure that there's a fair, uh, a fair share uh, going to all members of society, uh, a fair distribution of the benefits of our economy. Um, and the third big priority is a smarter economy. And that just means uh, doing more with less. You know, kind of like uh, our approach to transport. We can get better outcomes in transport. We can spend less money, reduce congestion, help people get around simply by changing what we invest the money into. And that's a smarter approach. It's an approach that works for everyone. It's better for the environment, better for the economy, better for the transport system. So all three of those priorities, cleaner environment, fairer society, smarter economy, are linked to education. Like tertiary education is part of the way that we're going to get there. And uh, I have to say that under this national government, and I'm trying to understand why it is, but um, I think that they have kind of a simplistic approach to the economy and to society. I think they believe that if we treat the country like a business, and if we treat universities like businesses, and if we force them to just uh, crank out um, cookie cutter workers to help supply the needs of um, uh, an ever simplifying e economy, uh, that we'll all somehow be richer. And I think they miss uh, some of the more complex ways in which uh, society functions. And education is important for economic success, but it's also important just to have educated, informed, well-rounded members of society. And that's important for reasons other than just making money. That's, that's part of how democracy functions. It's, it's, it's part of being human. It's, you know, it's more, we're more than just workers and laborers or employers. There's more to us than that. So uh, over the past few years that National has been in power, um, they've been slowly eroding uh, the ability of people to study and, and eroding the resources that are available to the, to the tertiary sector. Um, there haven't been increases in funding um, in line with inflation, and so every year it's getting harder to study. Now, if we want to have a successful, thriving economy, if we want to face the two big challenges that are facing our generation, which are basically climate change, ecological devastation, and, um, and inequality, uh, then we need to invest in education. 
Uh, that's part of the way that we're going to solve the problems that we're facing. And it's also part of the pathway uh, for those who are born um, into families that have fewer resources. It's part of the pathway to success is education. And so we need to make education available to everyone. Students are the only group in society right now who are expected to take on debt just to live and make ends meet. And that's not right. It's not going to get us anywhere in the future. Um, if we look at the countries that have gone down this path, like the country where I was born, the United States, um, they're not doing too well economically. Whereas there's other countries who have chosen to make education a priority, to adequately fund it, and to ensure that students have the support that they need to make ends meet. And I think that New Zealand should be a country like that. So what will the Green Party do? The Green Party has a fully costed alternative budget. We've costed all of the promises that we've made in the course of this campaign, and we've shown how we'll pay for it, while also increasing the surpluses to the Crown in the future at a faster rate uh, than National would do. One of the things we're absolutely committed to is reinstating the allowances uh, for postgraduate students and older students immediately. We also need a total review of the accommodation supplement and benefit, because it has not kept pace, particularly in places like Auckland, where the cost of living is uh, rising much faster than inflation across the country. And our other big policy announcement, which I was uh, very proud to be a part of, is our free off-peak public transport for tertiary students. I know that will make a huge difference to some people, not everyone, but it's one small step because we have to be responsible. We haven't got unlimited money, but what we can pay for very easily is free off-peak public transport for all students. So that would be our student green card. I think it's absolutely achievable. It's something that's been done in other places with a good deal, amount of success. And it only costs as much as one kilometer of motorway uh, that this government is funding. So it's a pretty good deal giving um, something like 350,000 students um, access to free off-peak public transport for a year instead of one kilometer of motorway. So um, the Green Party values education. And as part of our, our smart green innovation, developing a smarter economy, we've also uh, found money for 1,000 new places at universities in the STEM subjects. Now, that doesn't come at the cost of other subjects. So it's very important that we have humanities, that we have politics, that we have all the other areas of study. But we do recognize that there is a shortfall of students in certain areas. And so we're going to fund the universities and allow the universities to make the decision about how that's allocated. Finally, it's really important, important that students have a voice. One of the four principles of the Green Party um, is appropriate decision making. And that idea is that decisions should be made at the lowest level at which they affect people. And that's why it's really important that there's student representation on the governance bodies. And so we're absolutely committed to that. We oppose the Education Amendment Act number two because it's, it takes away the voice of the people who are directly affected by decisions that are being made. And it means that decisions won't be as robust, they won't be as informed, and they won't be as effective. So if you support a smarter, greener, fairer New Zealand, give your party vote to the Greens. Thanks. And now I'd like to invite John Minto. Enga mana, enga reo, enga hoi fa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Greetings, everybody. It is really nice to be here. And it's nice to be um, in a, uh, what, reason and, society, reason and science society meeting. As a science teacher and a maths teacher, um, those things are important to me. And I'm sure by the end of my short presentation, you'll see the, the wisdom of giving your party vote to internet mana. In the last 30 years, there's been this big battle in education, right? On this side, you have people who say education is a commodity to be purchased in the marketplace. Just like you go to the supermarket and you decide which kind of baked beans you're going to get, you buy your education here in the marketplace. 
There's the other school of thought, which is mine and internet manas, that, you know, that uh, education is a basic human right and every citizen deserves the same high quality no matter what your background is. Now, that was the system that I was brought up with, and that's how I got my education. I got it completely free. Okay, there was just one nominal fee you paid at the start of the year, maybe $20 or $30, and everything else was paid. As well as that, I was staying in Palmerston North. I got an accommodation supplement, paid all of my accommodation expenses in Palmerston. And then when I went to Teachers College to be a teacher, I got paid a salary while I was training to be a teacher. That's the education system we had. But in the last 30 years, ACT, National, and in the early days, Labor pushed education really hard over here and said that students must start paying for their education. It's something that you buy in the marketplace and the government shouldn't pay for the whole lot. And in the late 1980s, it was Labor that introduced student fees. And then, since then, those fees have just gone, you know, spiralled upwards and spiralled upwards to the point where they increase now even greater than the rate of inflation. Well, internet mana, we say that we can afford to have free tertiary education again. I'll come back to that in a minute. We can afford free tertiary education, and free means free. It means you don't pay any fees, and it means if you're, if you're living away from home, you get an accommodation supplement if you don't have a course um, closer to, to your home to, to attend. We can afford it. Now, what's happened in that last 30 years is what we call neoliberalism. You know, the idea took over that somehow if we let the rich get extremely rich, that money will trickle down and we'll all be better off. I mean, total bullshit. <laughs> total bullshit. So, think about this for a moment. What's if, if the country can't afford it, as Mr. King and uh, others will tell you, um, Stephen Beer will tell you, we can't afford it. What do they really mean? Well, let's look at where the money's gone that would normally have gone to pay for tertiary education. Let's take a minimum wage worker in New Zealand, right, on the minimum wage, $14.25 an hour, works 40 hours a week and gets paid a salary. And then they pay tax on every dollar they earn and every dollar they spend. So they pay income tax, they pay GST. And if you add it all up, that minimum wage worker pays 28% of their income in taxation. 28%. Now you take someone else, let's take someone from the rich list. Say um, John Key, for example, right? He's Prime Minister. How much tax does John Key pay as Prime Minister? 33%. Well, he's got as, um, he pays 33% on his income as Prime Minister, which is 428000 so he pays $132,000 in tax on that. But then he's got another income. His wealth increased this year from 50 to $55 million. He had an increase in wealth of $5 million. He didn't earn it. He didn't, and he didn't pay any tax whatever on it. So the Prime Minister's effective tax rate on his earnings are 2.8%. So the minimum wage worker pays a 10 times higher tax rate than the Prime Minister. That's what's happened in New Zealand. There's been this massive shift in wealth from the poor, from people on low and middle incomes, to the rich. And the 170 wealthiest New Zealanders last year got an increase in their wealth. This is just 170 people, the same number of people as, as in this room got an increase in their wealth, unearned increase, and an untaxed increase, three and a half billion dollars. Not million, three and a half billion dollars. That's not how much they own, how much the, their wealth is. That's just the increase in their wealth. So what I'm saying is that we have now a system where the heavy lifting in tax is on families on low incomes and middle incomes. And one of the worst features of it is GST, which no politicians ever want to talk about. Because GST, National never talks about it, Act never talks about it, but it is a vicious tax on low-income families. And it's a tax where if you're in the poorest 10% of New Zealanders, you pay 14% of your income on GST. Okay, 14% for the poorest families. If you're in the richest 10%, you pay less than 5% of your income on GST. 
So we've got to get rid of GST. It is a vicious tax on the poor. And so our whole tax system has been shifted to benefit the rich. And now the rich don't want to frickin' pay for anything. John Key pays, the, you know, 2.8% tax. He drives his car on the motorways. He uses the schools. He uses the hospitals. He uses everything taxpayers pay for, but he doesn't want to pay for it. The rich never want to pay for it. Their, their tax is voluntary to them, right? And if they do get caught out not paying enough, well, they just get a flash lawyer and they negotiate with IRD how much they will pay, and they'll come to a kind of a compromise. So we've got a vicious system, and you people are paying for it. You people are paying for it. So unearned income and untaxed income is the reason that we do not have the money to pay for tertiary education. So internet money, we've got big plans to pay for or to make sure that the rich and the wealthy pay their fair share, the same as everybody else. John Key should pay 33% on all of his income, not just his Prime Minister's salary. So we can do it, it's achievable, and uh, I hope that when you think about that, that you'll, you know, you'll think about giving your party vote to internet mana. Kia ora koutou. And lastly, Stephen Berry. Good evening. I'm the candidate for Upper Harbour and number six on the party list. I'm running for the party vote to get Jamie White elected to Parliament. And now for something completely different. Every other party contesting this election has a tertiary education policy based on cheap bribery, taking the easy path to vote buying rather than the principal path actors taking, which will lead to higher quality and fairer tertiary education system. Many parties don't even disguise this tactic, advocating free tertiary education for all. Yeah, yeah. Such a policy would be an unmitigated financial disaster for the, for the tertiary education system disaster. and the government's box. Come on now. I'll let you finish, John. Tertiary education is a product. It's like a can of baked beans. It isn't a right or an entitlement. It's not something that you get automatically from the state, no strings attached. Some people make a deliberate choice not to pursue tertiary education, and therefore it is not fair and equitable to expect them to fund the people who do choose to do so. When financial cost is a factor, people make far more rational choices in their education. Under a purely taxpayer-funded system, the incentive to pick quality courses that will actually build the foundations of a future career are reduced. Gender studies looks like a far more attractive option when you can get a student allowance and don't have to pay back the costs at the end. <laughs> if there is no cost to your studies, then the likelihood of a high dropout increases. If you haven't spent money on studying for a qualification, get tired of studying for it and then cease the course, you have invested nothing and lost nothing. Having your choices in life fully funded for free by the state creates a very perverse incentive system and decreases the success rate of our educational system. Acts believes that it is far more important for the government to allow the right conditions for a dynamic economy to occur so that students who have made rational decisions about their education can enter the job market, earn a decent salary and start paying back their student loan quickly. Act will set the stage for creating this dynamic economy by cutting the top rate of income tax from 24, uh, down to 24% next year and to 17.5% by 2020. This tax reduction will be funded by eliminating welfare for the middle classes. One example of this is interest-free student loans. The purpose of welfare is to help the people at the very bottom. People who are unemployed or single mothers with no income. Individuals who have completed a quality universal university degree are already equipped with the best possible tools to begin working in high-paying careers. They don't need any further assistance from the state. 
Interest-free student loans currently cost the government $600 million a year. It is a cost that is not needed and cannot be sustained. Price controls on fees charged have also distorted the quality and efficiency of the tertiary education sector. When a service provider is subsidised by the government, the incentive to control costs is reduced. Income for the provider becomes less an issue of attracting students by providing a quality product and more an issue of getting handouts from their friends of the government. While the cost to the end user may be reduced by a subsidy, the cost to the government itself always increases out of proportion because universities have no incentive to control costs. The effect of charging real costs would incentivise tertiary institutions to look at their own costs. Internet-based learning has greatly reduced the cost of many tertiary degrees while giving students access to world-class teachers. At present, tertiary institutions have no incentive to make use of these changes in education. ACT would expect the overall cost of these changes to reduce the level of tertiary funding required as price signals become clearer to students. ACT also wants to ensure students have the best possible information available to be able to make rational decisions about which course they wish to study based on a career they wish to pursue. There are many poor quality courses at tertiary institutions and courses with very poor employment outcomes. The large number of media courses is an example at a time when the media is employing fewer journalists. Students have no way of assessing courses and ACT believes that the tertiary sector should fund a website that informs students of the post-course employment outcomes of all courses, advises students what the pass, fail and dropout rate is, and what the pass rate is when compared with the entry grades of students. This will enable students and their parents to make more informed choices, saving the taxpayer money, and preventing students getting into a debt for a course that they will even fail, or even if they do pass, find it, it does not lead to employment. Sorry to keep you all in suspense there. In regard to student allowances, ACT does not believe that access to these should depend on the income of your parents. People in their early 20s are adults, independent from their parents, and responsible for their own choices. In many cases, students are supporting themselves, as they should be, and it is the parents themselves who will be paying back the costs incurred in these studies, not their parents. Therefore, parental income in relation to student allowances should be irrelevant. I'm especially proud to be standing as a candidate for the political party which introduced the private members bill which eliminated compulsory membership of student organisations. In the 21st century, decades after compulsory trade union membership was ended, it amazes me there are still people out there who think you should be compelled by the law to join associations you don't want to join. Effectively, they want to force you to be a socialist. <laughs> and see, the problem with socialism is that it's such a terrible system, they have to force you to join it. <laughs> the advocates of forced association are declaiming that an alleged reduction in the quality of student representation because no, people are no longer compelled to join the organisation and fund it. If this is the case, Shouldn't that make it blindingly obvious that the services provided were rubbish in the first place? If student unions are worthy of joining, then people will do it voluntarily. They'd be queuing around the block. Of course, that is the other problem with socialism. There's always queues. X wants to restore quality to the delivery of tertiary services. The polls are now open. If you can see that the big government solution to tertiary education is an expensive failure, that politicians interfering in outcomes are depressing our economic potential, and that the sector will perform most efficiently when it has to operate like every other successful private sector in the country, then I ask you to cast your party vote for ACT. Thank you.
All right. That uh, concludes the introductory phase of our debate. We're going to have about a five-minute break now. You can stretch your legs, relax, and so on. Some of you will probably not come back, but you know. <laughs> but I would recommend staying, because so far we've had an opportunity to get a, what we might characterize as sort of fairly broad policy introductions from the various different representatives. And in the next hour or so, we're going to ask a series of questions that would be much more sort of um, uh, point, uh, pointed into the, you know, asking for more specifics on questions of tertiary education policy. So in five minutes, we'll resume. Thank you, sir. We're getting a little round of applause.